youngest son. And before he turned 18, actually for my birthday, he gave me this beautiful painting that his teacher painted of me, like a portrait. Because he wrote this essay, and she was so impressed by what he wrote that she wanted to make a portrait of me. So he gave it on my birthday. It was very touching. And I thought to myself, wow, if I was able to make such a difference in his life, and that you know he's happy, he learned how to cook, he learned how to clean, he learned how to you know have fun and study and so forth, then it, it is wonderful. Um, all of my boys, all three of them, I have three sons, had learned to make bread when they were young, you know, uh, starting around seven years old. And they even have had businesses. We were homeschooling all three of them for some time. And they had a business making bread. And dad worked for the city of Fontana and the city of Irvine. And he would take bread to the city and of there were a lot of employees so the city manager would buy it the city mayor would buy it you know the different department people would buy it he said one it was the funniest one day it was the funniest day he went walks into the city mayor's office and he has his feet on his desk and he has a loaf of bread in his hand and he's just <laughs> you know <laughs> grabbing uh, and, and enjoying it so we had lots of fun cooking with our children and doing things together as a family. And so I want to encourage all of you moms and dads <laughs> and grandparents that the best gift that you can give to your children is to teach them how to cook. To teach them, um, first of all, for you to cook healthy meals for them, to purchase healthy food, not to have junk food available in the home, and then to model healthy eating. You know, when you eat that broccoli, to say, yum, this is so good. <laughs> and those Brussels sprouts, wow, they're so delicious, you know? And then to teach them to enjoy this healthy food. And I think Tina here with her son is doing that, and that is so wonderful. And Vicky is doing that already. And so it doesn't matter what, what age your children are, whether they're two or three, it's best to start young, or whether they're 15, it's never too late to begin. Because you know what I have found? Um, I have found in my practice with my patients, I get all these children into my office, <coughs> and they don't eat fruits, they don't eat vegetables, they don't even know the names of the fruits and vegetables, and I have never why don't you eat that? I don't like it. Well, why don't you like it? My kids don't like that. Why don't they like it? Do you eat vegetables? No. So you see, we're passing the bad habits from the parent to the child. And so they don't know what vegetables look like or that they taste good or how good they taste. They only know, you know, the little snack foods, the little uh, fruit snacks that come in a little box or, or the 100 calorie fruit snacks or whatever it is. But we need to change that. If we want to have healthy children, if we want to have healthy families, we need to make it our number one business to give this gift of health to our family. And it's fun. You know, preparing meals as a family is fun. To me, it's much more fun to be together with your family to prepare a meal than to go out to some restaurant and wait for them to serve you who knows what. You know, and, and who knows what the conditions are in the back as far as cleanliness and so forth. So it can be a very, very good thing. Okay, so I just found as I was preparing for this lecture some new research that really amazed me. Recent research points to the possibility that a diet on mental health um, can be passed across generations. Now, what does that mean? Evidence indicates, next slide, that what you eat can affect your grandchildren's brain molecules and synapses. Can you believe that? What you eat as a parent will eventually influence your children's and grandchildren's brain molecules and synapses. This is according to 
Dr. Gomez Panilla, a professor at UCLA Neurosurgery and Physiological Science. He has spent many years studying uh, the effects of food, exercise, and sleep on the brain. So the exciting thing is it's never too late, whether you're a senior or you're a parent, but it's, it's always good to do it early. But if you haven't changed your eating habits and health habits early, it's never too late to change them later on. So to me, that's really exciting news. Pardon me? Synapses is where the brains make the connections. The brain cells make the connections, yes. And so now, um, there's another important point here about caloric uh, restriction. You know, by the time we reach middle age, most of us have gained like five pounds or 10 pounds around our waist. You know how that goes. And this increases our risk for diabetes, for blood pressure, and um, also it increases our risk for small strokes in the brain and makes us more vulnerable to the damage of free radicals. So Dr. Walford, from UCLA, he's a gerontologist. He showed that lifelong calorie restriction dramatically prolongs life expectancy and maintains optimal brain fitness. So what does that mean? It means that if we restrict our self calories and we don't overeat, and if we do that day after day after day, then we're uh, going to prolong our life expectancy and our brain will be much more physically fit. And you know what? He did this study in rats, but he was so convinced with his research. Do you know what he started doing? He started fasting one day a week <laughs> because he wanted to live long. Or, and he started skipping meals if he didn't fast. And it's very interesting, a health writer in the 1900s, a nutritionist, she said that skipping a meal or fasting once in a while, it's very good for your health. And I believe that. I have experienced myself days of fasting. But to see it actually proven right now that restricting our calories uh, will improve our life expectancy and maintain optimal brain health is an amazing fact. So we don't want to overeat. You know, when you eat and you think, should I grab another piece of apple pie or should I have one more slice of bread? If that's your temptation, that's my temptation. You know, I could have one more slice of bread. But no, if I do, I'm going to feel stuffed. And if I'm stuffed, then I'm going above my limit. So you always want to leave the table just before you're totally stuffed. Go brush your teeth and it's over. No more snacking. You don't want to. Uh, you know, make your teeth dirty, right? So we want to talk about do you need an oil change? We do oil changes in our cars, right? And we do them regularly. How regularly do we do them? Every three months? Or uh, how many miles? Three to 5,000 miles, right? That's what they recommend if you want your car to last. What about the oil change in our diet? Do we keep on using the same oil over and over again that we did um, in the past? And now there's more evidence showing which is the best oil for our body. This is uh, the percent of calories from protein, fat, and carbohydrates. If you look, you can see that in the 1970s, early 1970s, we were e getting almost 38% from our calories from fat. Now in the 2000s, we're getting about 33% of our calories from fat. So the fat is decreasing. However, we still have a problem. An insidious villain is at work in our country, quietly disabling and killing more Americans each year than all the wars on, of this century. And that villain is the food, the fat in the food we eat. So even though we have decreased our fat consumption, we still are eating too much fat, and we're eating the wrong kind of fat. Um, 
as a nation, we're growing bigger and we're growing fatter. Two-thirds of the adults are overweight. One-third of the children in this country are overweight. And the problem, like I said, we're eating the wrong kind of fat. Let us talk, let me just share with you a study that was done by Dr. Dean Ornish uh, in the year 1990. Dr. Dean Ornish studied 50 men with advanced heart disease, and he put them into gr two groups. The group on the left, he, um, oh, before that, he told both groups to exercise, okay? They both were put on an exercise program, daily walking. They both were told to quit smoking. The only difference in the two groups, the group on the left, group number one, was put on a low-fat vegetarian diet, less than 10% fat, zero cholesterol. The group on the uh, side two was put on the American Heart Association prudent diet of 30% fat, 300 milligrams cholesterol. After one year, the arteries in group one on the 10% vegetarian diet, they became wider. The plaque disappeared and it was removed. Heart disease was reversed. Do you know what happened to the group number two on the American Heart Association diet of 30% fat and 300 milligrams cholesterol? The arteries became more clogged and they were more advanced in their heart disease. So. The diet that is recommended by the American Heart Association is still killing people. It is still too high in fat. So we need to look at what we can do to prevent disease. The good news is that much of today's diseases can be prevented through diet, like this uh, study shows. Now, f not all fat is bad. We need some fat for life. As you can see, fat is our main source of energy. It is part of all the cell membranes in the brain and the nervous system. It helps with the absorption of vitamin A, D, E, and K, and all our phytochemicals, which we will talk about next week. It makes our artery walls more flexible. It keeps our blood vessels open in the brain and it helps us in blood sugar control. It reduces inflammation, and inflammation is very important to be reduced because that causes strokes and heart disease and diabetes and certain cancers. It influences the production of neurotransmitters. These are the uh, chemicals that give messages in the brain and hormones. But there are problems with a high fat diet that lead to obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, and stroke. Let's talk about the good fats. These are called the monounsaturated fats. The, the way you recognize a monounsaturated good fat, or they call them also MUFAS for a short uh, abbreviation, MUFAS are liquid at room temperature. They turn solid when they're chilled. And sources of MUFA fats are your oils, such as olive oil, canola oil, peanut, sesame, and sunflower oils. Um, sesame and sunflower seeds, I should say. Uh, avocados, almonds, hazelnuts, pecans, pumpkins, and sesame seeds. We don't get enough of these monounsaturated fats in our diet, but they are very, very good for us. Question? Yes. What about corn, oil? corn oil is not here. Right. So yeah, that was left off on purpose, because I know people are used to using corn oil, thinking that that's a good oil. Okay, let's find out where's corn oil. Polyunsaturated fats they're liquid and at room temperature and also when chilled. The sources here are your sunflower, corn, soybean, and safflower oil. So the corn oil is not as good 
as the olive oil and the canola oil. The canola and olive oil are the best oils. And I realize that in the news there has been some misinformation stating that canola oil is not good for you, but that is not true. So how ma many calories should we be getting from PUFA polyunsaturated fats and MUFA monounsaturated fats? Okay, 10 to 20 percent of our total calories should come from um, MUFA fats and polyunsaturated fats about 8 percent. Actually that MUFA should be a little less because we don't want 28 percent of our calories is fat. We want more like 15 to 20, 25. So that, that figure was a little too high. Now th the omega-3 fats we want to talk about. Now omega-3 fats are essential fatty acids. What that means is the body can't make it. So we have to provide it in our diet. And this includes flax seeds, walnuts, chia seeds. It's a tiny little seed that's very costly. I, I went to, to that health food store there, the co-op, and it was like $20 a pound, yet online I found it for $6 a pound. But chia is a very good seed, a tiny little seed. Soybean and flaxseed oil, kiwi, Kiwi, did you know that kiwi has omega-3s? Uh, you have a handout that gives you the top sources of omega-3s, and one cup of kiwi has 27 milligrams of omega-3s. And soy nuts, have you seen soy nuts? Uh, soy nuts are expensive? I think one of the problems here is that you don't have Trader Joe. If you ever go to a place that has a Trader Joe, like Washington, D.C., or I don't know, some other towns, you can buy these healthy type of things, but also unhealthy things like wines that you don't want to buy. But they have a lot of nuts and healthy type of products that you can buy. Um, soy nuts are not very expensive. They even have a soy nut butter I, instead of soy peanut butter. And walnuts are excellent source of flax seeds. Almond butter, yes, it's excellent, but also very expensive here on the East Coast. On the West Coast, that's where we produce the almonds, so you can get nice, fresh almonds every year. Almond butter, you know, we have our sources there, but here it's kind of, we've brought lots of these good things, but they're, they're being eaten, so the storage <laughs> is low. <laughs> Sure, you can make your al almond butter. If you have a champion juicer, you could make your own nut butter. Yes. And, and it tastes really delicious, or your own peanut butter also. Oh, kiwi. Okay. Kiwi is, uh, we have it right here, it's a little green fruit. Uh, it's actually brown on the outside and green on the inside. Yes, it's a good source of vitamin C. It's a very good, healthy uh, type of fruit. Now, huh? It has omega-3 oil, yes. Omega-3. Let's look at the health benefits of omega-3s. They lower your bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol. They raise your good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol. Another way to raise your good cholesterol is to exercise every day, to walk. It lowers your triglycerides. These are your fats that are usually elevated in people who have high cholesterol, people who have diabetes. So it lowers those. It reduces the risk of blood clots, it reduces inflammation, and prevents heart disease and stroke. Now look, here we have several studies that have looked at the different nuts and how they lower your bad cholesterol. And which nut is, has the greatest effect in reducing your bad cholesterol? Walnuts, that's right. Walnuts reduce it about 17%. And then what's the next nut? Almonds, about 15%. And the next one is peanuts. 
Okay. Now, what about uh, what kind of effect does eating nuts have on the risk of coronary heart disease? They looked at four different large studies that were done. The first one was this Adventist Health study in Loma Linda in 1992. They found out that people who were eating nuts, I think it was like three, four times a week, they reduced their risk of coronary heart disease by 50%. A simple thing is eating nuts, walnuts, these were in this study. But yet the same study by a women's health study, which was done uh, in 1993, they showed a 60% de uh, reduction in coronary heart disease. And then um, nurses health study didn't do that well. Then the physician's health study again brought it to 50%. So basically around 50 to 60% you can reduce your heart disease by eating a little handful of nuts every day. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that easy? much easier than taking a drug, like a statin drug, which has a lot of side effects. That's a good question. That's right. You want to get your nuts just plain with nothing on them except nuts. If you want to roast them, the other day I was making some oriental dish and it called for roasted slivered almonds. So I put them in, the, in a food processor and it slivered them and I put them in the oven. It, it was roasted. Very simple. You roast your own. You know, you pay more for roasted and you don't know what else they put in it, right? Okay, so where's the fat? Let's look at the foods that have fat and the percentage fat that they have. Your butter, margarine, shortening, and lard are 100% fat. And so if you took a cup of any of these fats, butter, margarine, sh shortening, or lard, it would be 1,900 calories, OK? And that applies to oil. One cup of oil, if you use it in some cookies or, or I in a cake or in whatever, 1,900 calories. It's 100% fat. Okay, peanut butter is 80% fat, so one cup of peanut butter is 1,500 calories. Nuts are anywhere from 75 to 92% fat, and that's 800 calories. That's a little mistake there, 800 calories. Now, you know what? When the nuts were made, the creator put a hard shell around them. Do you know why? <laughs> so we wouldn't eat too much. You know, nuts were not made to be put in a can, in a tin can, so we can grab a handful. You know, I had patients who would go take, have a handful of nuts, and then another handful by the day's over, they have a pound of nuts, you know. And that would be two cups of nuts. That would be over what? Over 1,600 calories of nuts. You see, they were made, they have a hard shell, so we are moderate how much we have them. They're very good for us, but we don't want to overdo it. Now let's look at pork and beef and red meat is 65 to 80% fat. So anywhere from 500 to 800 calories per cup. A double whooper is 60% fat, that's 970 calories, and whole milk is 50% fat, and that's 160 calories. Processed cheese like Velveeta is 60 to 85% fat and about 450 calories. And cream cheese is 90% fat, 850 calories. So that's where we're getting our fat. And besides, of course, in all the candy bars and the snacks and the different foods. We're going to look at that a little later. Now, what are the sources of saturated fat? Meat, poultry with skin, seafood, lard, butter, cheese, whole milk, dairy, like uh, ice cream and cheese, palm, palm kernel, and coconut oil, baked goods, fast foods, fried foods. So if you have a high cholesterol, and even if you don't, you want to focus on the saturated fat, not on the cholesterol. Because this is the rule. With a few exceptions, the levels of saturated fat 
and cholesterol usually occur in the same foods. So meat is high both in saturated fat and in cholesterol. Uh, milk is high in saturated fat and cholesterol, and so on. But there's no cholesterol in plant foods, zero, zero, zero. Plant foods have no cholesterol, only animal products. So how much saturated fat can we have? Well, we really don't need any. The best is zero. However, most people are not willing to live with that. So the maximum is 7% of our total calories, OK? So that translates to less, about 140 calories, 15 grams of saturated fat on a 2,000 calorie diet. However, if you go to McDonald's and get a sausage patty, that's your 12 grams of saturated fat. So you blew it in one sausage patty. Or if you get a biscuit and ham, that's another 15 grams. So you can blow it in that. Fif the whole saturated fat for the day. What about the fat in the meat and in the chicken you may have that day? Or if you have a, um, you know, ice cream or you have any other type of cheese, OK? It, it all adds up. Let's talk about trans fat. These are the very bad fats. And these, most of these fats, they are man-made fats. That's why they're so bad. They were made by heating liquid vegetable oil and adding hydrogen. Now, hydrogenation converts this liquid oil into a solid fat. And it makes it more stable, less likely to spoil. It's ideal for frying and fast foods, and they can reuse it again and again. Like when they make French fries, what do you think they do? They throw out that bad fat? No. They use the same fat and keep on frying in it all day long, again and again and the next day. So this fat is very, very damaging to our body. It is found in vegetable shortenings, some margarines, like the hard margarines, fast foods, French fries, donuts, Danish pastries, corn chips, potato chips, commercially prepared foods, pies, cakes, biscuits, and crackers. That just about wipes out all the fun foods, right? <laughs> That's why it is so important for us to get into the business of making our own healthy food so we don't have to get clogged arteries, right? From all this stuff that is prepared that is not good for us. So these fats are so powerful that eating only a very small amount does damage to your body. Eating 2% of your calories from trans fats a day increases your risk of coronary heart disease by 23%. Now you say, wow, you know, I don't eat that much fat. But if you look at it, one medium french fries has that much trans fats. So if you eat one medium french fries a day, you're increasing your risk for coronary heart disease by 23%. Let's look at uh, saturated and trans fats and the negative effect they have on our health. They impair our mental function. They can interfere with the brain glucose metabolism, the uh, metabolism of sugar in our brain, they can cause a general decline in energy. I've had patients who are on this kind of a diet that's high in saturated fats and animal fats, and they have no energy. And they start changing around and eating more plant foods. And they come back, and they feel so good. They say, we feel so light. I feel young. I feel like jumping. You know, it, it, it really makes a big difference. Um, it can cause a general decline in energy. It can cause blood cells to stick together. You know, our blood cells, our red blood cells, they are designed to go single file in the little capillaries, one by one following each other. When we eat too much fat, they stick together. You have 10 or 20 of these red blood cells clumping together. So guess what happens? If they're clumping together like that, then um, they can not carry a full load of oxygen. And if they don't carry a full load of oxygen, they also can't carry a full load of good nutrition. So if they're not getting oxygen, the red blood cells, and if they're not getting the nutrition, they're going to um, 
start being injured. They're going to start be, being accessible to disease. And, the, you know, they're going to start causing disease. So it's the, every little tiny organ and, and cell suffers when we have too much fat. And when we, I have a really good video of what happens when you have too much fat done by a doctor, my husband's doctor. I was going to show it to you, but we'll save that. We can't show you all the good things. When we have our cooking school, we'll show you that video, what fats do to your body. And of course, it increases your bad cholesterol and decreases your good cholesterol. Then it increases your risk of blood clots. It can cause atherosclerosis, which is the hardening of the arteries. It can decrease the alertness and concentration of your brain and increase cognitive impairment and depression. See the little red blood cells? There they are. They're floating nicely by themselves. But when you take too much fat, they get stuck next to each other. Then they have a hard time going through your little arteries and th uh, through your capillaries, tiny capillaries. So the big question is, what's better, butter or margarine? Well, let's look at the fat. Saturated fat is 65% in butter. Is saturated fat a good fat or a bad fat? It's a bad fat. So it has a lot of saturated fat. It has trans fats, 5%. Is that a good fat? That's a very bad fat, OK? So it has 65% of a bad fat, 5% of a very bad fat. And then it has. Um, 70% of the two bad fats combined, it has 33 milligrams of cholesterol and a little bit of vitamin E. And then margarine, on the other hand, has 15 to 20% saturated fat and 15 to 35% of saturated and trans fats. And it has more vitamin E added to it. So. Butter has more undesirable fats, but most of the margarines out there also are not good. I have brought one margarine that is the best margarine, in my opinion, that I recommend. But really, it's even better to do like the Italians. You know what the Italians put on their bread? <laughs> olive oil. The only thing I'm afraid about olive oil, when you pour, you can really pour. <laughs> Over pour. But uh, yeah. So. I gave you a handout that gives you tips how to cut out the bad fats and how to increase the good fats. There's a whole list, like 13 things you can do, but we'll just talk about some of them. Check the, out with the bad. Check the labels for trans fats and eliminate. Avoid fast foods, especially fried. Um, eliminate trans fats from pastries, chips, crackers, danishes. Limit your intake of saturated fats. Avoid frying. It's possible, yeah. Limit your, or avoid using vegetable shortening, corn, sunflower, or safflower oils. You don't, you don't have that handout? Hmm. I know I copied it. We'll have to find it. Yes? It's sort of like the sunflower seeds itself. Mm -hmm. No, sunflower seeds are excellent, yes. So it's not applied to like the oil? Yeah, the oil, this oil is a polyunsaturated fat, and the monounsaturated fat is better. You want to have more of the mono and less of the poly. That's why we're saying that. Oh, so, yes, it does. And that's, that's a poly. It's a poly. It's, it's have less of that, yeah. OK, now, in with the good. Eat a quarter cup of walnuts every day, OK? Do you see my collection of walnuts? We brought like 30 pounds of walnuts in the shell from California. So if you happen to go to a place that has nice walnuts, you can put them in the freezer, and they keep like fresh. And you just take them out and shell them as you need them. They keep for years fresh. Um, saute your vegetables in a little bit of vegetable oil or use a spray or canola oil, or saute it in water, even better yet, in water. You know, last week we had the greens that my husband made, those uh, greens with collards. And y did you use any oil in that? No, no oil. No oil. He, yeah, he sauteed 
the onion and the garlic in water and uh, you know put the greens and lemon juice and so forth. Uh, you want to choose non-fat dairy products. Replace the butter with liquid olive oil or earth balance margarine. Use olive oil or canola oil. Make your own salad dressing. You don't have to, you know, spend money on salad dressing. You can make your own. You put one third olive oil, two thirds freshly squeezed lemon juice, and salt, and you can put garlic powder or a little bit fresh garlic, and you have a delicious salad dressing. Now, what is the optimal dietary intake? Based on that study by Dr. Ornish, they were having less than 10% of their calories from fat. So the recommendation for saturated fat, 0 to 7%, monounsaturated 9 to 11, polyunsaturated 6 to 7, a total of 15 to 25% of your calories coming from fat. Now, the recommendation for men is about 1,800 to 2,000 calories a day. So if you're a man, if you're going to get 20% of your fat, you would get no more than 360 calories. On 1,800 calorie diet, 40 grams of fat. For a woman, uh, intake is about 1,400 calories per day. 200 calories from fat is only 32 grams of fat. Just approximate figures if you want to do some counting. We want to limit our use of visible oils. One tablespoon of vegetable oil is 15 grams of fat. Now, one cup has how many tablespoons? Has anybody ever counted? How many tablespoons in a cup? 16. 16 tablespoons in one cup. Multiply that by 15. 16 times 15 is how much? How, how much? Come on, we need some good mathematicians. <laughs> 16 times 15. How much is that? 1,900? 19, 1,900 calories in one cup of oil. OK? No? 15 times? No, sorry. No, it's not grams. 15 grams. Uh, grams is 240, but it's uh, 1,900 from that other slide we had. 1,900, yes. In other words, one cup of uh, oil or fat is equivalent to all the calories a person could, could eat in a day. In a day, that's right. That's right. And one tablespoon of salad dressing has seven grams of fat. And the suggested fat intake is 40 to 60 grams, which depends on your calories. One tablespoon of margarine or oil represents 20 to 30 percent of your daily fat intake. So that doesn't leave us much fat if we want to follow this heart healthy diet. Let's look at the health benefits of omega 3 for the brain. Very important nutrient in reducing risk of depression. Recent research research shows that bipolar disorder and major depression can be helped by a diet in high omega-3s. You know, uh, when we had a restaurant in California, uh, we had a lot of people come to our restaurant and they saw changes in their life. They were happier, they were feeling better, and their cholesterol was falling down. And one of the physicians who lived in the area, he came and he my mother happened to be the cook at that time, and he, he said to her, do you use any fat in your soup? Do you use any oil? She says, yeah, a little bit. She says, I want to ask you to do me a favor. Don't put any fat in, the, in your soups. And from that day on, my mom didn't put any fats. He was sending a lot of his patients to eat there. Would you believe it? These people would come day after day. After about 10 days to 14 days, their cholesterol dropped down tremendously by 50 points, OK? Their triglyceride came down. Their good cholesterol went up, reducing the fat in the diet. And they were so grateful that they had a place where they could go and eat a low-fat 
low cholesterol diet. So if you make these changes, it's guaranteed you're going to see results. It's, it's a very good thing that we encourage you to do. Even I should have said on the first day of class, if you had a chance to go to your doctor to get your cholesterol done, your HDL, your LDL, your triglycerides, your blood sugar, and see a difference after four weeks or after three months of following this. You're going to see definitely a difference in your blood lab results. Okay, there are mental effects of omega-3 deficiency. It increases uh, the uh, risk of depression. It has been linked to increased aggression in prisoners. And this is a very, very interesting study to me um, about children who, who are breastfed versus those who were not breastfed. Th there's a difference. baby formula are low sources of omega-3 fats and human breast milk has much more uh, omega-3 fats and research has shown that today's adults who have given infant formula in the past had an IQ 9 to 10 points lower than those who are receiving human breast milk. You know they didn't know that 30 years ago when I was going to school but now they're finding this out that people who were given or babies who were given a um, milk formula or who are given a any other kind of baby formula had a lower IQ of 9 to 10 percent because they didn't have any omega-3 in the diet. Now you have heard that fish sources are good sources of omega-3 especially cold wa water fish. Now the interesting thing that a lot of people don't know is that fish get their omega-3s by eating cold salt water seaweed. So when we get omega-3s by eating fish, we're getting our nutrients secondhand. Now I don't know about you, but I always want to get my nutrients firsthand. So fish should be avoided due to lake contamination with heavy metals and other contaminants. I gave you an article, I, I didn't have time to cover this time what are the problems with fish, but I gave you an article that you can read about it. Happily, there are wonderful plant sources of omega-3s that have no side effects, that, that, that don't have any uh, mercury contamination. Okay, and the top source of omega-3s are flax seeds. One tablespoon of flaxseed oil has 7,526 omega-3 milligrams. Walnuts, only a quarter of a cup has 1,703 mil milligrams. Canola oil, one tablespoon has 1,094 and black walnuts have a little less. Wheat germ oil is pretty good. Uh, one tablespoon is 938. Green soybeans, how many of you have eaten uh, green soybeans? Edamame. Anybody here? Very, very delicious. I brought a sample for you to try. They're high in protein, they're high in fiber, and they're also high in omega-3s. Spinach. Now it says canned, if cooked would be the same. One cup of cooked spinach is 353 milligrams of omega-3s. Almonds have a quarter of a cup. It's not as high as walnuts, but they have some. So there are many plant sources, and I also gave you a handout that has the plant sources of omega-3s, okay? How much omega-3s? Dr. Nedley, he, who has written a book, Depression the Way Out, and who has had many depressed patients, he recommends for individuals who have depression or bipolar disorder, he recommends that they consume each day dishes that include some foods high in omega-3s. So basically, you look at your list of omega-3s, and if you have friends, there's many people depressed today, you know, give them the list, and they can eat those foods on a daily basis that are high in omega-3s. In addition to that, he recommends a home remedy that he made up that has helped a number of mentally ill patients to recover. And this is the home remedy, flax nuts sprinkle recipe, a quarter cup of walnuts ground up with a 
quarter cup of flax meal, a tablespoon of date sugar or raw sugar, one eighth of a teaspoon salt. You mix it together and you put it over your cereal, over smoothies, over yogurt, anything you want. It's very, very delicious and it's very easy to make and we usually make it once a week but it'll last a while in the refrigerator and I will show you how we make it and it's wonderful. It you know, it has fat, the good fat, so it gives you energy. You start your breakfast with that. It's wonderful over your cereal. Let me ask you something. If you were to go to Kroger and you were looking for caffeine, coffee, you, want, you went to your favorite coffee aisle to get some of your coffee, and it wasn't there. Now, this has really been happening in our Kroger because they have turned everything upside down. Not even they know where they have put it. But if you were to go there and you don't find the coffee and you ask the salesperson there, you know, where'd you put the coffee? And they say, well, coffee has been transferred to the pharmacy department. And you say, to the pharmacy? You know, how weird is that? So you go to the pharmacy department and you talk to the pharmacist there and the pharmacist says, I think you're looking for some coffee. And you say, yes, I am. And he says, OK, uh, but let me first just write you a little warning slip before I give it to you, because coffee is now considered a drug. And this is what the warning slip would say. This drink contains caffeine. Possible side effects include addiction, tremors, nervousness, anxiety, chronic fatigue, stomach irritation, um, Worsening or cause of psychiatric illness, impaired physical and mental performance, and may impact spiritual and social dimensions of your character. And you say, no, thank you. I don't think I'll get coffee this time. But this list is actually documented of the effects that coffee has on people. It is a drug. And it affects our brain, it's an addictive drug that causes many health problems. Let's look where is the caffeine hiding. Um, 16 ounces of Starbucks brewed coffee has 320 milligrams of caffeine. Drip coffee, one cup, has 140 milligrams. And brewed coffee, 115. A cup of black tea has 65 milligrams and Excedrin is just one of the pills, but a lot of the pills have caffeine. Excedrin has 65 milligrams. Java water has 12 ounces, is 100 milligrams of caffeine. And a Coke and Diet Coke is 45. A green tea, a lot of people say green tea is so wonderful for the antioxidants. It, it's true it has antioxidants, but it also has a coffee, a caffeine that alters your mood and your, your whole mind. I would rather get my antioxidants from the vegetables. And we'll talk about the, those sources next week. Yeah, we're going to talk about that too. Okay. Legal drugs that damage the brain. We have alcohol, we have nicotine, and we have caffeine. They're legal drugs and they do damage our brain. But sometimes it's hard for us to face that truth if we're used to that. But there is something better. I'll never ask you or encourage you to get rid of something in your lifestyle or diet if there was not something better. There is always something better. You know, this is a message from our master designer, from our creator. I love these verses. It says, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. You know, someone who has designed our body knows what is best food for it. And he doesn't want us to waste our money on things that are not good for us. So the superior brain diet is your fruits, nuts, grains, vegetables, beans. This is the best diet that gives us health. It imparts, this kind of a diet imparts strength, a power of endurance, and a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. 
Okay, thank you very much. Now, now we want to do something fun with some of the foods. Since we talked about caffeine, they're good substitutes. And we, we have some here. We will have some for you to try. This Pero Instant Natural Beverage. It's 100% caffeine free, and it's uh, made from malted barley, barley, chicory, and rye. And it's very, very delicious. And you can have some coffee creamer, silk, soy silk coffee creamer. There are many other brands. This Roma caffeine uh, uh, roasted grain ba beverage, I've been told by people who drink coffee, is the closest thing to it. It has zero caffeine. But I couldn't find it here in Roanoke. I don't know why. They don't carry it. Um, so these are all very, very good for you. And then there's a lot of herbal teas that have zero caffeine. They're good for you. Almond Sunset, Raspberry Zinger. They have different herbs, and some of them tell you what they're good for you, what they're good for. There is um, Black Cherry Berry and Roast Aroma. This tastes kind of like a coffee. Now, there are even different herbs to calm you down that have herbs that are calming. Like this one has peppermint leaves, ginger root, chamomile flower. Chamomile is very, very calming. It's a good tea to take in the evening before going to bed to kind of just relax you. And um, so this tension tamer has lemongrass that's also cal calming, catnip leaves, uh, lemon balm, hops. Uh, there's another one called Sleepy Time, but I don't have that with me. And that one, if you're having a hard time falling asleep, it's a good herbal tea for falling asleep. This is a country peach passion that's good, raspberry infusion, and chamomile. So these are wonderful drinks that you can have that have absolutely no caffeine. And you know, another good thing that is not food related, if you're used to drinking coffee, when you get up in the morning, you had your nice walk if you can, if you have time, and you go in the shower and you take a hot shower as hot as you can, bear it for two, three minutes, and then you turn on the cold for a minute, and hot and cold and hot and cold for three mi times. You will feel so invigorated. You will feel wonderful. It will wake you up better than any cup of coffee. Believe me. And you know what happens inside the body, all the... Uh, blood cells, the white blood cells, the fighter cells, they get busy and they're helping you protect from the cold and disease. And when you go out there, you know, you don't feel the, you don't feel so chilled. You feel energized. You feel wonderful. So that's a good thing to do too. And then here, if you want to make soda, right? We talked about soda and someone asked me, what am I going to drink? Well, I brought you, there's also, you know, Welch juice, there's apple juice, but you know about these. But this is a white grape raspberry juice that's very delicious, 100% juice, no sugar. You can mix it with one of these Perrier or your favorite mineral water. And these mineral waters have uh, naturally no sodium. Actually, this one has 10 milligrams of sodium. And then there's uh, a white 100% juice, white, grape, and peach. So that's also a very good one, okay? So you can mix a lot of this water with, the, with this juice, and you can make your own soda if that's what you want, okay? It's great. So there are wonderful substitutes out there. Now, as far as the edamame I was telling you about, by the way, I got this at Trader Joe's <laughs> in Washington, but they do have it at Sam's Club, but it comes in the pod, so you have to take it out. They have it at Kroger? They do? OK. This is very, very good. This has 120 calories for half a cup. It has 5 grams of fiber and 10 grams of protein in half a cup. So it's very, very good. Chinese store has two. Very delicious and cooks very rapidly. OK. As far as to make. The sprinkle, remember I told you the, uh, the walnut flax nut sprinkle? I, I have this uh, coffee grinder, and it's really good for putting your little nuts in here, seeds. And so I put my flax seed in here. You know, this is the golden flax seed, and this is the brown flax seed. They both 
have the same nutritional value. The golden flax seed tastes better. It's kind of a nutty flavor. So I just put it in here, you know, make it really fine, and then mix it up with the walnuts. And uh, we have the sprinkle for each morning for our brain, for the omega-3s. Very, very important, very good. And by the way, if you don't have one of these, this is also very practical. Got this at Marshall's, but they have them everywhere. It was a good deal there. You put your walnuts here, and then you put them here, and then you can just quickly, you know, shred them. They're not so fine like the flax meal, but that's fine. They have little chunks, okay? So you need some of these practicals, a few tools that are practical to eat your good and healthy way. Okay, and um, I just, we want to talk about how much fat is in some foods, okay? Let's say you went and got yourself a burger, a hamburger, and a hamburger and french fries, okay? A large burger. I don't know if this is a large one or not, but this is the kind I could get for my plastic food here. You know how much fat you will be getting? Okay, this is one tablespoon is 15 grams of fat, okay? So I have here 15 grams of fat, okay? How much is it now? 30 grams of fat and 45 grams. So this is the total fat for a man for a day just from a little burger and french fries, okay? That's how much fat you're getting. All right, but that was only lunch and breakfast. If you had bacon and eggs and who knows what, that's, <laughs> we don't even want to talk about that. Well, afternoon comes along and you know you get hungry because this didn't have enough fiber. It had lots of fat, but didn't have enough fiber. So then you decide you're going to get some chips, right? Let's look at the chips. Now these chips, uh, it says, are 150 calories. They have 8 grams of fat, which is worth about 70 calories. And there's about 8 chips for this 9 grams of fat. 9 or 10 grams of fat, okay? So it would be nice if I could have a plate. Could somebody bring me a paper plate, please? Or several, actually. Okay, so here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so this is just nine chips. And that is one of these chunks of fat. But who stops at nine? Come on, you're hungry, you're nervous. <laughs> Your coworker is giving you a hard day, so you take another, okay? So there goes another chunk of fat, okay? And so, you know, you put it aside and you're working on your computer, and this has happened to me, you, you're working on some file and you lose the whole thing. And what do you do? You get another little chunk, you know. So before you know, there's four handfuls of fat, and that's about 40, another 40 grams of fat to add to your lunch. So that's 80 grams, right? Okay, but you're not done yet. You're going to go home, and you're going to have a piece of your favorite meat, a, a, some kind of a steak or something. Now this steak here, it's about the size of my hand. It's as thick as my hand. 
And how, how, how big do you think it is? How many ounces? Eight ounces, that's right, eight ounces. I had patients who came to me, I use a lot of these plastic foods to figure out how much people eat. You know, because we underestimate our portions. You know, and I had patients, men, you know, they would say, what? What is this? Eight ounces? That's nothing. I have two or three of those, okay? <laughs> but let's say that the person had one of these, okay? Well, one of these is going to be one. Oh, there's one more plate. Okay. Okay, we have one. So that's 15 grams. Two. 30. Three. 45. Four. 60. Okay. There's our beautiful piece of steak with 60 grams of fat. So we already had the chips, which were 40. We had 40 with the burger and the fries, that's 80. And another 60, how much is that? 140, right? And, you know, sometimes people are not enough with that. A couple of hours later, they're watching TV and there's all these good snacks and things coming on. They have some ice cream, right? A bowl of ice cream. That was usually the pattern with my patients. And that's another you know, another 20, 30 grams of fat. It depends how many scoops and what you put. If you put some chocolate syrup and so it goes. So you see, the fat you eat turns out to be the fat you wear. Okay? All right.